My name is Jake Begard, and I serve as the program manager of the Common Ground Initiative here in the Howenstein Center for Presidential Studies at Grand Valley. On behalf of the center, Dan Churchwell, and our partners at the Acton Institute, uh, thank you for being with us tonight, whether you're in person or on Zoom. For those of you joining us in person, I remind you of Grand Valley's face covering policy and ask that you please keep that mask on while you're with us indoors. In a moment, we'll hear from one of our students in the Peter C. Cook Leadership Academy for tonight's Leadership Minute. Then Dan Churchwell, Director of Program Outreach at the Acton Institute, will introduce our speakers and our moderator for this evening. From there, we'll move into the main presentation and then follow that with audience Q&A. Staff will walk the phones with the aisle, so we'll begin preparing your questions, please. Maybe you've noticed, maybe you didn't, but I'm almost certainly willing to bet that you did. Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp all went down earlier this month, and in the days and weeks that followed, we heard renewed calls from Congress and members of uh, everyday Americans say that we need to update or even implement new regulations against big tech. One thing is sure, over the last 18 months, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us the shortcomings and the silver linings of our societal relationship with technology. So what can we learn from the events that have transpired since March 2020? And more broadly, how can we move forward as a nation Tonight, we look forward to our speakers to offer prospective answers to these questions. Now, I would like to introduce our next speaker. Olivia Rodriguez is a senior in her first year in the Leadership Academy. She's set to graduate in 2022 with her bachelor's in political science and Latin American studies. Please help me welcome Olivia to the stage. My name is Olivia Rodriguez, and I am a Cook Leadership Academy fellow candidate. Around this time last year, I sat down with my mentor, Dr. Stark, as he told me how he believed I would be an excellent candidate for the Cook Leadership Academy. The program he described to me sounded amazing, but I immediately thought, why would someone like me belong there? Dr. Stark had recognized something in me that I had not yet, but had been there the whole time. I had taken on many leadership roles, but never truly felt like a leader. I knew that I had leadership-like qualities, but always questioned if that was enough to actually identify myself as a leader. I slowly began to recognize the leadership victories I had successfully navigated and learned that a great leader has confidence in their own abilities. My growth in leadership confidence grew tremendously as I began my role as Vice President of Latino Student Union. The Executive Board and I worked all summer to plan the events this semester and it is so rewarding to see these plans come to fruition each week at our meetings. Through my work as a program assistant for Latinx initiatives at the Office of Multicultural Affairs, I served as a panelist for this year's first Conversation of Color, where students of color led dialogue about how the global pandemic affected communities of color and our online learning experience. The turnout for the event was so successful that attendees stood along the back of the wall of our office because there were no more seats available. My leadership skills expanded through my role on the Laker Familia Advisory Council, where I support student peer mentees, which is a fulfilling role to have in my campus community where I can support other Latinos. I also helped plan and facilitate the three-day 2021 Laker Familia orientation, which included lots of meetings, outreaching, communication, and training. I am proud of myself as a first-generation college student for all of my achievements and for the growth I have noticed in myself throughout my leadership journey. My name is Olivia Rodriguez, and I am a leader. Good evening. My name is Dan Churchwell, and on behalf of the Acton Institute and the Howenstein Center, it's a pleasure to co-sponsor this event this evening. Uh, I have the pleasure of serving as the Director of Program Outreach at the Acton Institute and co-sponsoring events like this with Jacob and the, uh, the great team here at the Howenstein Center is a distinct pleasure. Uh, tonight, I would like to introduce our two speakers as well as the moderator for the event tonight. Carl Sasbo is Vice President and General Counsel at NetChoice, where he advocates for free expression and free enterprise in the internet. Carl is also an adjunct professor of internet law at George Mason uh, Scalia School of Law. Carl has testified before nearly every state legislature and before the U.S. House of Representatives and Senate on antitrust matters. He has also testified in over a dozen state legislatures on issues related to content moderation, and he has appeared on dozens of broadcast outlets 
on tech issues, and his company is currently leading uh, the lead plaintiff challenging the Florida law on content moderation and the Maryland digital ads tax. Carl has regularly sought for comment and stories from the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, Washington Examiner, Bloomsburg, and Reuters. Before joining NetChoice, Carl worked for the law firm of Wildman, Harold, Allen, and Dixon, and also Arnold and Porter. He's also worked for the Motion Picture Association, the Electronic Software Association, and the U.S. Office of Government of Ethics in the University of Amer excuse me, and he holds a JD from the Catholic University of America, where he graduated magna cum laude, and holds BAs in economics, managerial studies, and policy studies from Rice University. He is joined by Rice Hammer, uh, Josh Hammer, excuse me. Josh Hammer is opinion editor of Newsweek, a syndicated columnist, a research fellow with the Edmund Burke Foundation, and counsel and policy advisor for the Internet Accountability Project, a frequent pundit and essayist on political, legal, and cultural issues, Josh has been published by many leading outlets, including the LA Times, the New York Post, National Affairs, American Affairs, the National Review, City Journal, and Public Discourse. The American, uh, he has also had formal legal scholarship published in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy and in the University of St. Thomas Law Journal. Josh is a uh, campus speaker throughout the Intercollegiate Studies Institute system, Young America Foundation, and the Federalist Society. He previously practiced law at Kirkland uh, Ellis LLP and clerked for the Honorable James C. Ho of the United States Court of Appeals in the Fifth District. Josh has also served as a John Marshall Fellow with the Claremont Institute and is a graduate of Duke University and University of Chicago Law. Tonight's conversation will be moderated by my colleague, Michael Matheson Miller, who is a research fellow and director of Acton Media at the Acton Institute. With 10 years of international experience, Miller has lived and traveled in Europe, Asia, Africa, and Latin America, and lectures internationally on themes such as moral philosophy, economic development, and social theory. He is a frequent guest on radio and has been published in the Washington Times, Detroit News, and the LA Daily News. He is the director and host of the Poverty Cure DVD series and has appeared in various video curriculum, including Doing the Right Thing, Effective Stewardship, and The Birth of Freedom. Much of his current work at the Acton Institute involves leading Poverty Cure, which promotes entrepreneurial solutions to poverty in the developing world. Before coming to Acton, he spent three years at Ave Maria College of the Americas in Nicaragua, where he's taught philosophy, political science, and was the chair of the philosophy and theology department. He holds degrees from Notre Dame, Franciscan University, and the uh, International School of Management and the Thunderbird Graduate School of Global Business. His latest book on the topic we're talking about tonight called Digital Contagion, 10 Steps to Protect Your Family and Business from Intrusion, Cancel Culture, and Surveillance Capitalism was published last week. Please welcome with me the speakers for tonight. So thank you, Dan. Thank you, Jacob and Hallenstein Center. I'm Michael uh, from Acton, Acton Matheson Miller from Acton. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. It's an honor to be uh, here uh, moderating this debate with these two gentlemen who know a lot about law and politics and big tech. And so, um, I, as Dan mentioned, I just uh, finished a little book called Digital Contagion, which is quite critical of uh, digital technology. So one of my colleagues said, oh, well, that's, that's great. We have a very indifferent, uh, you know, nonpartisan, uh, you know, non-biased host uh, for this debate. And uh, that is not true. I'm, I'm very biased. But uh, when it comes to this question of what's the best way to solve the digital problems we're in, I don't know. I'm not sure. And so this has been really interesting to talk to uh, both Josh and Carl and learn uh, different perspectives of how to think about this. So I hope you uh, enjoy this as well. So we'll start. Um, I'll be asking a couple questions. We'll have some discussion and debate. And then at a certain point, we'll open it up for Q&A. So if you're, if you're dying to ask a question, you will be able to. 
So uh, why don't we start, so the, this, the topic of this uh, is big tech, is it a big problem? Big tech, big problem. So why don't we start with you, Josh? You've written a bit about this, talked about it, about this, or quite, quite a bit about this, and talked about this. Um, do you see tech as a big problem, I guess, first of all? And what do you think are the biggest threats that we're getting from big tech right now to um, social life, to family life, uh, to the American uh, political landscape? Okay, well, thank you so much. Can everybody hear me okay? Good? Great. Okay, well, thank you so much to uh, Grand Valley State, Howenstein Center, Act Institute for this very generous partnership. Uh, it's my first time in Grand Rapids, I think my first time in the entire state of Michigan, actually. So very happy to make that maiden trip here and be with you all tonight. So it's, it's a lovely evening. So big tech. Um, the short answer to is it a big problem, from my perspective, is a resounding yes. Um, uh, difficult to know exactly where to start. So I'll kind of start similar to where we started earlier in a, in a conversation that we had over lunchtime. If you just look at the S&P 500, if you look at the, the list of the largest market cap companies on the S&P 500, literally the top five U.S. companies are all massive tech firms. In no particular order, it's Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Microsoft. And I would argue that right there, ipso facto, by, by, by that very fact, it is problematic for the, same re for the very simple reason that we shouldn't want one industry to have that much pure corporate accumulation of power. It really ought to immediately, I think, have us think back to the late 19th century, the Gilded Age, the Robert Barons, all the trust busters of the railroads, Standard Oil, John D. Rockefeller, all that stuff that we recall so fondly from civics class in high school. But the problem actually is much worse, and uh, uh, it's substantially worse than that, I would argue, not merely by dint to the fact of their size, but what they're actually doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And the best way that I can analogize this is Again, if we think back to civics course in high school, we all remember kind of 1776, the Declaration of Independence on July 4th, but we ought to probably think about Thomas Paine, who in the, in the town square back in, 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 in Philadelphia in 1776, when he wanted to kind of rally up his countrymen, his you know, pre-revolutionary countrymen at that point, he would go around the common square passing out his pamphlet of common sense. Well, the 21st century, year 2021 equivalent to running around the, the town square passing around common sense is posting on Facebook or posting a tweet, Twitter thread, or something along those lines here. The problem is that we have, as a society, chosen to delegate, to outsource our sovereignty over our own uh, an analog of the, com of the public commons to unaccountable private actors, to almost uniformly leftist, liberal, Silicon Valley elites who have extra legal immunities in the form of Section 230, which I'm sure we're going to get into at some point tonight, and who have been basically the recipient of a largely hands-off approach to antitrust enforcement as well. Facebook, for example, has obviously acquired Instagram and Facebook. Google, Amazon, have, uh, Amazon in particular, which I just wrote a recent long essay on, has had a million types of horizontal and vertical acquisitions over the years. So they control the means to the public square. They also, by dint of that, control how we interact with one another on a human-to-human -human basis. We have literally outsourced the way that we interact with our fellow human beings to private actors. And uh, we're all conservatives up here. There was a much more traditional strand of conservative thought, of lowercase r republicanism, that kind of weed its way through the American founding. I think founding fathers like Alexander Hamilton intuited this very, very, very well. Even kind of Teddy Roosevelt, who was anathema, I know, to a lot of kind of like free market fundamentalist purists, he understood this very well as well, which is government at the end of the day is ultimately one thing that by dint of the fact that we still live in a lowercase r Republican system, we have sovereign control over here. So when it comes to the most bare bones necessities, who controls access to the town square, the commons, who controls access for for, for vendors to reach their sellers. That happens on Facebook all the time for millions of vendors across the entire country. We don't want to outsource, outsource that to unaccountable actors here. And then just real quick on, 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 the, on the concrete harms, I mean, you know, there's a million examples here, okay? The, the, the Wall Street Journal recently had these in-depth investigations about how Facebook knew very, very well that Instagram was toxic. It was cigarette-esque addicting products for the children. They didn't care because like any rational Milton Friedman-esque corporate actor, they're trying just to maximize profits for the shareholders. They have a fundamentally different set of concerns than the public writ large and uh, uh, Republican self-governing folks have. 
So the, the, the products are addictive, and more so, I would encourage everyone here to actually watch a documentary called The Social Dilemma. I'm the opinion editor of Newsweek and a podcast there I co-host. We're actually partnering with The Social Dilemma on kind of a mini-series of sorts here. There's a Netflix documentary last year just kind of going on and on about just the harms that these algorithms have. And Facebook, Google, I could talk, Amazon, I could, I could kind of pick pick which place to start, but I don't want to take up any, a whole lot more time here. But Amazon, just for instance, Reuters had a report earlier this week or last week where they showed it in India, and if they're doing it in India, I guarantee you they're doing it here, where Amazon is taking data from third-party vendors, about 35 to 40% of whom exclusively rely on Amazon for their entire profits. They're taking that data and then using it to kind of manipulate their algorithm to preference their own products. Blatant violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act from my perspective. Google is, is consistently manipulating its search engine to kind of prioritize its own results. YouTube is demonetizing conservatives left and right. PragerU has been a long lawsuit for that. So I, there's all sorts of problems here. I'm going to cut myself off there because we want to keep this ship going. But um, yes, it is a big problem. OK. Um, just a quick question, and then I'll go to you, Carl. So like, I'm just saying, some people might say uh, to you, well, you don't want the state to control the public square either, right? Because then whoever's in the regime is going to shut down people. And we always have private newspapers. So, you know, and I'm, I want to go short on this. I know it's a complex question because I want to get to Carl. But just, just one question, like, why, why is digital media more of a threat than newspapers when some people would argue before talk radio and then uh, Fox News and then you know, Facebook and Ben Shapiro and the Daily Wire where you worked, mm -hmm. you really had a very monolithic, almost like state media. And this has opened things up a little bit. Um, do, what do you think about that? And, wh and why is that like, why are, we, why are you worried about it now when it seems like, and, and let me make one last point here, like one of the big critiques that you got from a lot of people on, on, in tech who are critics from the left, now, this is complex. Some of the great critics on tech, I think, come from left and have been doing that for a long time. But post-2016, you got, oh my goodness, here we thought tech was going to be really good for us, and Trump won. So tech must be really bad. And now it's kind of like, oh my goodness, now we got Biden, and tech's bad. So like, how do you respond to that sense? Like, Isn't this just the way the public square goes, and isn't it better for conservatives? Well, there's a lot to unpack there, and I'm going to try to be real really brief for the sake of time. It was unfair. I, I agree. <laughs> it's it was okay. un unfair. Um, so I, I guess I would push back on the premise a little bit here. If you go back to the time of the American founding, newspapers were quite partisan, but I don't think they were as uniformly partisan as we think. I mean, all it takes is kind of a cursory review of the election of 1800, for example. You know, that's the election between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, which was an election so incredibly vitriolic so as to make our modern elections look, you know, positively tranquil by comparison. And um, the newspapers were kind of, I don't want to say they were evenly divided because I don't have the metrics in front of me, but many of them were kind of partisan Federalist, Federalist Party newspapers. Many were partisan Democrat, Republican, Jeffersonian newspapers. So there was, some, there was a little bit more of an even mix back then, even as recently, really, probably as three, four decades ago. You know, the Chicago Tribune used to be a right of center editorial board. Obviously, you've always had the Wall Street Journal. So even like the newspaper industry up until the past few decades is probably a little more balanced. But the broader conceptual point that I want to make here is that back then, we had a robust common law of defamation. Um, we, we, you know, in America, we inherited the English common law. This is one of the great early era, early republic debates, kind of the John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, kind of more Anglophilic wing of the founding wanted to inherit the common law. The Jeffersonian, Madisonian wing said no. The former obviously won. And we, we inherited the common law. And the common law of defamation was robustly enforced, libel, slander. There were all sorts of tort liability suits that weave their way through the state judicial system for about a century and a half until a case in the 1960s called New York Times versus Sullivan, which basically read it out of the common law. So the point here is that the common law of defamation was great. In my opinion, we should try to make it great again. But the tech companies are not subject to that because of Section 230 immunity, which I presume we're going to get into, of course. Yeah. OK, good. Thanks. All right. That's, it's, um, Carl, um, you probably have a different view of the benefits of big tech. You, I mean, you're welcome to talk about some of the negatives, but you, you're, I think, in response to, to Josh, you probably have some, some, you have a more of a positive and optimistic view. You know, and it's, 
before we sat down here, we were talking about religion and, and kind of the history of religion and stuff like that. In religion, there's something called the scapegoat. Uh, basically, the community would, would put all of their horribles, all of their problems, all of their transgressions and misdeeds, and they would saddle it onto the goat, and they would send it out into the wilderness. And then, therefore, they were not the sinners. The goat is now carrying all their sins. That's where the phrase scapegoat came from. And that's what I feel like is happening now is the, the phrase big tech has become this empty vessel into which we pour all of our complaints about everything that's wrong with society now. And rather than looking internally about what can I do, what as a parent can I do, what as a member of my community can I do to make the problems I see better, I can just say, well, it's not me, it's them. They're the problems. And once we address them, then all will be good. Rainbows, cats and dogs living together. It'll be a fantastic time. And that's what I think we're talking about. So we need to start defining what is big tech. OK, so Josh gave us a definition. He said it's the top five businesses in the world that are American, which I personally think is something we as Americans should celebrate. We have a technology. We have a innovation that no one else in the world has. The next runners up are China, and not much coming out of Europe, and not much coming out of the rest of the world. It comes from America. Now, below them comes a couple other businesses, Walmart, McDonald's, Burger King, KFC, American brands that are worldwide. And I think that's something to be celebrated. So if we're going to define big tech, quote unquote, as only Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google, then any complaints about Twitter and their actions cannot be part of the conversation because they are not big tech. So Twitter removing Donald Trump cannot be a complaint that we foist upon, quote unquote, big tech. If we are defining big tech as only those five businesses. If we're going to define it as something else, we need to include others. Should we include Comcast? Should we include Oracle? Should we include a myriad of other businesses? So that's a fundamental problem that we start with in this conversation, is where do we want to foist all of our problems, all of our blames? Now, for me, when I look at five businesses that are competing with each other, I would call that robust competition in the marketplace. If you look at our choices for soda, what are the typical two choices you get, Coke or Pepsi? Uh, going back to my prior example, clearly dinner's on my mind, McDonald's or Burger King. You typically have markets where you have a handful of choices, and we call those robust competitive markets. When you have two competitors fiercely fighting for consumers' attention, for consumers' dollars, we call that a competitive market. It is not a trust. Now, to analogize it to the robber barons of old, you, of course, need to think back to what they were doing. Well, let's look at JP Morgan. JP Morgan assumed control of a single siloed industry. Rockefeller had a single siloed industry. Vanderbilt had a single siloed industry. Railroads, oil, uh, basically banking that ended up buying oil and a bunch of other things. But they weren't really competing with each other. Who was rich? Yeah. Did they depend on each other? Yeah, a little. But they weren't competing with each other. I think all of us recognize that time that we spend on Instagram is not time we're spending on YouTube. Time that we spend on YouTube is not time that we're spending shopping on Amazon. Time that we spend on Amazon is time that we're not checking our Office 365 work emails. So they're all fiercely competing. For what? For our time. Simultaneously, they're competing for businesses to advertise and back-end advertising systems. So that's a robust competitive system. The concern that Josh raised about the public square, and seizure of the public square, is a real concern. But what is the public square? I'm just going to give a, a possible definition. Uh, I would say the public forum, public square, is property that the state has opened for expressive activities by part or all of the public. Something that the state has created. I use the example of Boston Commons. That's something, it wasn't a private company that built the Boston Commons. No, it was Boston. And it was their commons. So the definition I just gave you is not mine just coming off the top of my head. That was actually Justice Thomas back in 1992 when he was looking at whether airports 
we're the public square? And he said, no. Well, airports seem a lot more like a public square than, let's say, Facebook. To enter an airport, you just walk through the door. To get onto Facebook, what's the first thing you do? You have to agree to their terms of service. You have to enter into a contract, a written contract. You're not doing that to enter the airport. So if airports are not a public fora, and just as Thomas says the public fora is something the state created, and now the wonderful thing about the tech industry, we took little to no federal dollars in that. Now Josh is going to disagree on Section 230, and we're going to have that debate. But it's not, public, it's, it's not government created like public square. Now, if we do want a true public forum that is entitled to all of the wonderful protections found in the First Amendment, and you, by the way, you can find copies of the Constitution right outside, uh, given to you by the House Dean Center, thank you. If you want all that entitlement, all those abilities, guess what? Then the government can create publicsquare.gov. We can have a public square, a legitimate public square created by the government. They cannot do any content moderation that would be violative of the First Amendment. And we can have the robust conversations. Simultaneously, we'll have all of the vile, lawful, but awful content that is entitled under the First Amendment. Child grooming, harassment, bullying, terrorist recruitment, pornography, obscenity is will violate the First Amendment, but not pornography. So if we want to live in that universe, the government can create it today. And I think as a conservative, I would much rather conservatives, rather than engaging in a takings of a private business, say to the government, well, the government should create the public for us so that we can have the Boston Commons that we used to have in an online environment. And the First Amendment will protect everything you say. So there's a lot to unpack. I think we're going to have a really cool conversation. And with respect to tech, I will say there have been some losses. I, as a parent, and I think we talked about this earlier, I, as a parent, struggle every single day. There's no Dr. Spox for the internet. I can't go to my parents and say, what did you do when I wanted my first smartphone? Smartphones didn't exist. I got my first uh, cell phone when I was in my mid-20s. So as a parent, is it tough? Yeah. And we're all trying to figure it out together. We're trying to figure out what's best for our families, for our children, for our parents, for our siblings, for our community. And that comes back to individual responsibility. That comes back to individualism. I would much rather those decisions be made by me and my spouse than by somebody sitting in DC. I'd rather those decisions be made by me and my spouse than somebody sitting in Lansing. I think I'm in the best position to know what's best for my family for my children. And there have been losses, too. The other night, uh, my son asked me, how tall was Mount Kilimanjaro? Well, when I was a kid, I would say, go look it up in an encyclopedia. Instead, we just asked Alexa. So there's that. But simultaneously, there have been other losses. Bar trivia night has been ruined by cell phones. But there have been great things at the same time. Now, whenever we have a question, now, whenever we realize we're out of toilet paper or diapers, we can access incredible choice, convenience, answers, and products with the click of a button. So like the famous Spider-Man phrase, great power comes with great responsibility. And I think it's up to individual responsibility to see us through, not bureaucrats in DC, bureaucrats in Lansing, or especially unelected bureaucrats in the federal government. Okay. So, Josh, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to respond to this, but I have a couple of questions. Number one, you don't need a public square to get all those bad things like pornography. It's on Google. We already have it. So you can sell your soul to them and get it. All right. So here, here let me, let me get, ask a question. But Google doesn't host that content. They are merely the... Yeah, the no, I know. I was just make, I was okay. making a joke up here. But... Um, because you were like, you don't have to, we can have the government do that. I thought, well, we already have all that. On oh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's there if it's you want to go okay. looking for it. So let me, you, you made this, you made this uh, um, point here. That you said it's kind of an empty vessel and the scapegoating yeah. question. And I think the scapegoating question is an interesting one because you do, it's, it's much easier to blame someone far off, especially as, um, you know, one of the things that like Gerard and others talk about the scapegoating is that 
there's there's contagion and so like okay we all like we all think big tech's bad and so it's easy to kind of join in on this um but at the same time you know i i, I pushed josh on his point about the public square how about i i want to say to you um you mentioned some of the negative things like bar trivia and i know you were joking but what about surveillance capitalism what about data collection what about like the wall street journal's reports on the effects of ment on mental health um, what about like, you know, Jean Twing is Twang, Twang is, I can pronounce her name, book iGen, where she talks about these things. Um, what about behavior modification? And, and I think, especially for you, Carl, because you, you're, mm -hmm. you're both a conservative, but also someone who really kind of, correct me if I'm wrong, kind of leans libertarian in that you, you want a limited state and you have, you, I've heard people who lean libertarian say to me like, well, what's the big deal with big tech? You know, they're, they're. They're taking your stuff. It's not the government taking your stuff. And I would say, great, except big, the government's outsourcing that to big tech because it's not as if all the data that was collected and that's used for behavior modification on children and adults isn't also accessible to the government. So how do you deal with like, the questions of privacy, surveillance capitalism, behavior modification, and all the negative mental health questions? That, to me, doesn't seem like an empty vessel. So let's go through the list, and, and I got three of them. So and it's unfair, because you got to go kind of quick. So, I'm, 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 so both of you, I'm being unfair equally. Okay, okay good. Is good. that right? I'm equally unfair. Okay. So the quote unquote surveillance capitalism, essentially what the argument there is, well, they know information about me and are going to show me ads for what I want to buy. That actually has been going on since the 1920s. Sears Roebuck when you ordered from the catalog. For those of you who are young in the audience, Sears is a department store that went out of business. Robux went out of business even longer ago. So they had a catalog. And you'd get a catalog in the mail and you'd order from them and, and all the amazing things would come. But what wasn't necessarily clear is, and what a lot of people don't know is, the catalog that you got was likely different from the catalog that I got. People actually got custom catalogs. They still do it today, actually based on the products that you've ordered in the past because they want to show you products that you're likely to order now or in the future. The same thing's true. One of the biggest data breaches uh, of public note, there, there have been some other big data breaches like Experian, which is a literal data collector. They're one of the credit bureaus. Or sorry, not Experian, um, e Epsilon, sorry. Um, so the other major data breach was Target. And a lot of people didn't realize what Target knows about you. When you go into a CVS, for example, or your local supermarket, and they ask you to plug in your cell phone number, your customer card number, so you can get those discounts and coupon codes. And somehow, I stopped when my kids got out of diapers getting coupons for diapers and started getting coupons for high C. That wasn't magical. There wasn't something coincidental about that. That was because they knew that I had no longer been buying diapers, and I started buying more adult product. Target knew so much about people that uh, they inadvertently sent a congratulations on your pregnancy gift basket to an expecting mother who turned out to be a teenage mom who hadn't told her dad yet. So this is nothing new. And, and remember, Target would not fall under the definition of big tech that we've discussed previously. So the idea of quote unquote surveillance capitalism is nothing new. It's been going on for decades. And the CVS, the supermarket, they're not giving you the coupons out of the goodness of their heart. What they do is they take that data, they aggregate it, they anonymize it, and then they give that to, to retailers so they better know who's buying their products. Is it somebody who's in their 20s, 30s, 40s, okay, 50s? So, so, you know? Sorry, because I, so you would just say that my questions to you, behavior modification, surveillance capital, data collection, is not that big of a deal. Not that it's not that big of a deal, but it is not limited to quote unquote big tech. It is not a novel creation. It is not something that suddenly fell upon us in the past five years. It's okay. something that we have accepted as a society and actually embraced because it gives us our coupons. It gives us advertisements for stuff we actually want to buy, not stuff I have no interest in buying or will never buy. And it makes it better for the businesses placing those advertisements because it makes them not only cost less, but makes them more efficient. So small businesses win, consumers win, and that seems to be a net good. We can always you know, activate incognito mode, use DuckDuckGo for our search engines. 
not put in our phone numbers at the supermarkets. Okay, you should read my book. Okay, so Josh, <clears throat> um, partially I want to have you respond a little bit to Carl. Um, because I think one of the things that, and, and you can feel free to respond specifically to some of the things he said and vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. But one of the things that struck me as, as Carl was talking, he, he you know, was, made the, the case, and again, of course, correct me the whole time, okay, this is part of what happens, that it's good to have these, not just the competition, and we'll debate 230 and antitrust a little bit later, but that this is a positive, net positive. And so the question I have for you, and then feel free to go in your direction, is it seems like your concern with big tech, or one of them is, that it's really not good for America. That, that the fact that code is not neutral, <clears throat> that the people writing the code are, are philosophical materialists, that means they believe it matters all there is. They're radical individualists. They believe in plastic anthropology, and they don't care about privacy because they want to use all of our relationships for transactions and that and then a whole other vision of the world is just bad for america it seems okay but carl thinks it's good for america like what what do you say to this so two quick kind of like thresholds just um things i'll, I'll push back on then i'll get to this wonderful question which there's a lot there to unpack as well um I, I, I think Carl is taking my first point about kind of just pointing to the fact that the five biggest companies on the S&P 500 happen to be tech firms and, uh, and kind of been assuming that I meant to define this as quote unquote big tech. I'm not a particularly huge proponent of the label big tech. It does tend to obscure more than it illuminates here. Um, I, I, Twitter is not to be exculpated in any way from the fact that its business model is atrocious and its profits and revenues are awful and it's a generally awful and crappy company and that it's not there at the top of the S&P 500. Twitter is run by the exact same kind of unaccountable, uniformly leftist Silicon Valley dweebs as all the other companies here and they absolutely should be in our crosshairs. Their total user base is dramatically lower than Facebook, but it does pack substantially above its weight, so to speak, as far as impact because it does kind of drive the conversation, the cable news, the, the, the talking heads and so forth kind of do tend to carry out the conversation on Twitter. So I just want to get that out there because I don't want to make it seem as if Twitter is somehow going to be off for discussion tonight because they most certainly are not. Um, the definition that was raised about the public square from Justice Thomas back in, in 1992, I, I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of Justice Thomas, the judge that I clerked for in the Fifth Circuit, clerked for him, probably my biggest mentor in the world, a former professor of mine, clerked for him. I've probably had dozens of friends clerk for him over the years. Um, is, he is literally the single greatest American currently living from my perspective. I hold him in that high esteem. But the definition that I heard, I think, is kind of, um, I'd have to see the full context and the opinion. I am not saying he's wrong, but for purposes of our discussion here, when I am referring to the public square, I'm not trying to interpret the word public literally in terms of like a Webster's dictionary definition of the term. We are talking about, proverbially speaking, where you go to carry out conversations. And the classical definition of the conversation kind of go back to the dialectic, obviously, and, and, and Socratic method and all that. The classical purpose of the conversation is to ultimately arrive at truth, to ultimately arrive at a capital T truth, really. That is a traditional notion of where a conversation takes place. So back then in 1776, when I was talking about Thomas Paine with the pamphlets, that was a literally public square, like public in the definition of that fact that it was state owned. Today, the functional analog of that happens to be a, a, an ostensibly private set of, of electronic code-based means. So, I just want, I, I, that's an important distinction to make here. I don't want us to get kind of bogged down as far as literally what is public. That was not at all the point that I was trying to make. Um, your question is a deeply fascinating one, and it does kind of undergird a lot of my skepticism is the, is, the, is the short answer here. So look, a lot of people from my perspective here, I'm a research fellow at the Emin Burke Foundation, as was said, that's a think tank um, most closely affiliated with my dear friend and mentor, uh, Yarm Hazoni, the Israeli political philosopher, is kind of the leader of the, national conservatism movement here. And a lot of us in those circles, a lot of us and our fellow travelers uh, on the so-called new right, if you will, a term that I don't, I don't particularly like that much, to be honest with you, we're basically trying to push back at what we view as kind of the pitfalls of 60, 70 years of neoliberal excess, of kind of excessive cultural deregulation and really kind of excessive 
economic deregulation in a lot of ways as well. I mean, I, I, on the latter, I'll, I'll hold kind of the specifics aside, but when I'm talking about economic deregulation here, I'm talking about this notion that um, shareholder profit maximization, trade, outsourcing, all that is all fine and dandy. I mean, we're here in Michigan. I don't need to tell you guys, obviously, that there have been some very serious downsides to kind of a bipartisan bromance of obviously kind of Nixon going to China and opening up our markets to, to, to all of that, to say nothing, obviously, of our manifold immigration woes. But the, the, the point here is that a lot of us do sense that this kind of overly liberalized notion, which really is, is encapsulated, again, I'm a lawyer by training, I, I, we, Carl and I both are, I think oftentimes back to this line that uh, Justice Anthony Kennedy gave us in the 1992 Plan, Planned Parenthood versus Casey case, uh, which is an abortion case, of course. And Justice Kennedy in that case, I, I don't remember the verbatim line, but paraphrasing, he basically says that it is the definition of liberty is for one person to kind of define his or her own conception of the mysteries of life and all that that entails. That is kind of the, that is the distillation of epistemically relativistic enlightenment liberalism taken to its logical conclusion here. And the concomitant flip side of that, the flip side of that coin, of that sort of radically myopic, blinded liberalism that maximizes kind of a radical conception of individual autonomy above all else, is, the, is, the, is the, the, the undermining and, if taken to its logical conclusion, ultimately destruction of faith, family, and nation state, the things that kind of in a, in a, in a greater and older and more traditional age, we held a little more dear here. So yes, I do see the big tech issue as being kind of a proxy, a microcosm for this broader kind of higher level philosophical disagreement here. The tech companies do view us as kind of like a series of like zero one zero one zero one binary code widgets that they that they are exploiting obviously for any number of ways in terms of kind of our data that they are then selling and outsourcing and things of that nature here. And more generally, if I can just bring it back to the tangible and the, and the practical a little bit here, what is what is actually happening is that we are so divided in this country. We, I, I mean, there was a poll from. Larry Sabato's University of Virginia Center for Politics that I saw about two or three weeks ago. Outright majorities of both Democrats and Republicans now think that the other party poses an existential threat, an existential threat to the American Republic. That is completely not sustainable. And the way that the algorithms on these websites in particular are manipulated, that's called, when, I, when I referenced the film The Social Dilemma earlier on Netflix, they, they, they kind of get into this. I would highly recommend it again. The algorithms are manipulated to try to drive our heart rate, to get our adrenaline pumping. They are literally designed to addict us and to make us hate our neighbors, thus only exacerbating all the trends that I was just, that I was just talking about, of making us further detached from our family, further detached from our community, further detached from our church or synagogue, and ultimately, again, God and nation state. So I do view these issues as being very entwined with one another. They ultimately are inextricable. And um, uh, I, I, you know, I don't think it's an exact. I, I don't think it's an accident. I guess we'd say that a more libertarian-leading person who probably doesn't agree with me that kind of a lot, some of these woes in the, of the Enlightenment liberal age have been as bad as I'm saying they are, such as Carl is taking the other side of this resolution. Okay. So one quick question for you on that: Do you think? And by the way, I also recommend um, Jaron Lanier. That's L-A-N-I-E-R, wrote a very uh, short and interesting book called 10 Arguments to Delete Your Social Media Right Now. That um, I've interviewed Jaron Lanier on my podcast uh, about this book, and uh, he, it's a very interesting book. And he kind of goes through the behavior modification. He's one of the founders of virtual reality, worked for Atari in the 80s. So he's a tech, tech guy, uh, and he's really worried about, about these things from a progressive perspective, uh, not, not a conservative perspective. Let me ask a, a question. And this is a big one, okay? But here, and then you can jump in on this too, Carl, and then I, wanna, then I want you to respond to, to so don't forget, because I know you're, like, you're ready, okay? Um, so do you think, perhaps, it sounds like you're saying that digital technology itself is part of the problem, meaning how we think of a polis, how we think of speech, how we think of meaning and reason is here in this room. You can hear me. You can see me. I'm embodied. I'm embedded. We're speaking the same language, right? We're, 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 in, a, we're in a relationship with one another. Not, not like we are with our spouses or anything, but this is a, a relationship. And that digital technology disembodies us, 
disembeds us and makes us manipulable. I mean, do you think this is, do you think perhaps, is there, is digital technology part of the problem that you're concerned with? So the short answer is I do, I do think that it absolutely is dehumanizing, and it kind of gets back to what I was saying earlier, that we, again, have chosen to outsource our sovereignty over, again, what is the functional equivalent of the commons, the public square, over the way that we interact with other human beings. The way the, the we have outsourced even the, the gateways to information. Like, they control what we see, how we see it, when we see it, in what manner we see it, what information I see, and what these two gentlemen do not see, and so forth. It is all up to unaccountable people. I mean, Carl is, is ranting against bureaucrats. I'm no particular fan of deep state bureaucrats or the Ministry of State. What is the functional difference between a bureaucrat deep in the bowels of some alphabet soup agency in Washington, D.C. Or, or suburban Virginia and some dorky computer science grad out in Silicon Valley who's writing terms of service that are completely not public and not transparent in Menlo Park for Facebook? There is no difference whatsoever. In fact, I would take the former over the latter because the former I can theoretically boot out at the ballot box every four years. The latter is completely not accountable whatsoever in any way. Um, I don't, having said that, I don't want to overstate my case here. Um, you know, I remember I was doing a Clubhouse chat back when Clubhouse was a thing. I, is Clubhouse still a thing? I, I, I don't know. know. Um, I, 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 did a, I was doing a Clubhouse chat, like, I don't know. It was like in February or March, I guess. And um, I guess That's this, when everyone was doing it. Yeah. And I guess this is all public, so I can, by definition, so I can just say it. So this guy, Declan Leary, who is an interesting character. He writes for um, AMCOM, the American Conservative. Declan is like a true, true, true trad Catholic, like a true traditionalist Catholic. And he, he was talking about digital technology, and he went so far as to say that it should be like a, a pressing and compelling uh, goal for public policy to ultimately eradicate computers. Um, that is not my stance, to be clear. <laughs> I, would not, I would not go that far. I am not so... Uh, troglodytic, we might say. I am not so aspiring for the proverbial stone age that I am looking to kind of like smash computers like the Luddites of old. That is not my stance. I do have a unique problem, though, with the way that a lot of these platforms and online marketplaces have developed and the way that they manipulate and affect the way that we ultimately are as human beings. So I, I, I don't think those are in a great state of tension with one another. There's obviously any number of ways that digital technology has been a net boon for us. I mean, like, whether it's TV, IMAX, I mean, like, you name it. I mean, I, I, I am not trying to roll back all of digital technology, but a lot of the current platforms, especially as it pertains to speech-related issues, I do ultimately do kind of sap us of our sovereignty. Carl. You want to um, yeah. respond to, to, he kind of took a shot at you. He said, no. you're libertarian-minded, don't take the common good seriously. So I, got, so is, I think I've got, I've got, I'm Catholic, I've got to go to confession for that. That's like sowing discord in public, right? Like, you know. But, but that's your job. Uh, so, <laughs> okay, so outside of the National Archives, solved. engraved in stone is a phrase. It's called the past is prologue. Uh, and, and, you know, essentially, the simple way, to non-fancy way, what's old is new again. And when Elvis was on TV or singing his songs, I remember there was a lot of concerns that he's destroying society with his dancing and it's going to corrupt the minds of our children and our teens and uh, the world is going to come to an end and society is going to fall apart. I remember growing up as a child, my grandmother would say when I'm watching TV, TV is going to destroy you, it's going to corrupt your mind, society is going to fall apart. This is kind of the way we react when there is change in a system. And that's kind of, in part, some of the exacerbations that, that I've heard tonight. And it, once again, it worries me as a parent. I have no guide to how to deal with my kids growing up in the internet era, much in the same way that my parents had no guide to raise me growing up in the television, cable internet, or cable era. So yes, when there is a new technology, people get worried and they worry that it's going to disrupt the way that we live our lives. And, and so that, that fear exists. But as, as Jacob started this discussion tonight and as he opened, Facebook went offline for about 48 hours this week or two, two or three weeks ago. We're still here. 
hopefully my plane departs tomorrow. Like life went on. And in fact, we knew within seconds of Facebook going down that Facebook was down. So if it is the only media, it's the only fora for conversation or news or discussions, how did we know it was gone? Well, because there are so many other ways that we get our news. In fact, most Americans today do not get their news from Facebook. They do not get their news from YouTube or Instagram or something like that. The number one place where we get our news is the place that we've always gotten our news. Newspapers, radio, television, and cable news. Number one with a bullet. When it comes to the internet, the number one place people get their news it's the websites of those offline corollaries, CNN.com, WashingtonPost.com, ChicagoTribune.com. The social media world is a micro set of where people get their news. Uh, so it, it's become this false narrative that's been created that, oh, it's, it's because of social media that everyone has misunderstandings of what's going on in the world. Place where we do have agreement in society today. Overwhelmingly, the five businesses that we started this conversation off with, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft, overwhelmingly Americans trust and like those businesses. Facebook's the lowest at 50. Most everyone else is in 70, 80% approval rating. So Facebook at 50 is pretty darn good considering they've, what they've been accused of over the past couple of weeks. Uh, where's our government? Our government's in the 20s or 10s. News media, how trusted, how much do you trust your local newspaper? How much do you trust CNN? How much do you trust MSNBC? How much do you trust Fox News to give you the straight truth? Those numbers are very low. And if that's where most Americans are getting their news, we have a fundamental breakdown in trust. And that's not something the internet did. That's something essentially the news media has done. We don't know where to get information anymore. We were talking earlier, we don't know where to get accurate information on medical advice. We don't know where to get accurate information on what's going on politically, what's going on socially, what's going on in general. There's a breakdown in trust in the news media writ large, and that's where most everyone gets their news. When we don't have trust and a reliable source of information, how are we supposed to know what to do? And that's a, that's a real problem that we need to solve. That's where I think society is breaking down. And that's not because of the internet. That's because there's more money in news media to go to the extremes. Uh, Fox News started it. It, made, it became the largest news network by going to the far right. Uh, MSNBC said, oh wait, we can make a lot more money rather than trying to be like CNN. We'll go to the far left. And now CNN realizes, wait, we can make more money by going to the left. And what we see is a breakdown in news, breakdown in trust. And so that's a fundamental problem. Now, to the notion of it's addictive. And uh, we, we both lived in, in uh, Chicago, in, in Illinois. And there's an amazing business in Illinois. And I'll tell you about it. It creates a product, highly addictive, easily accessible, cheap high margins, which means I can make a lot of money off it. We actually have baskets of it right outside this door. It'll lead to one of the largest health crises in America, obesity. It's called Mars. Famous for the Milky Way, the Mars bar, M&Ms, IMs, and a bunch of other things. But we're still allowed to go and get that. The government didn't come in and tell Mars, you have to make your nougat less tasty. You have to make your M&Ms horrible for a public health purpose. We created transparency, which is a good idea, but the idea that any business should make a product less desirable to a consumer is a horrible business model, and to the extent that it is quote unquote addictive, addiction can work in both directions. It can be good or bad. And there, uh, I'll just close with this. Okay, there's, so are you, oh, you're gonna close. Oh, just, just closing point. Speed, yeah. You're going on a speed round. Okay, so there's a Bible app out there, and what it will do, is it will ping you every day with a new Bible verse. And people will open the app and check it. And they become addicted to checking for the new Bible verses and reading through. That's an addiction. We would say, some would say that's good, some would say that's not good. But the thing is, it's up to the individual to decide. So addiction is really a term in the eye of the beholder. 
And if people are using these services because they can't have conversations in society because of COVID, that's probably a good thing. Sorry, go ahead. No, it's good. I mean, so let me just be probably provocative here, and then we're going to go into a very fast speed round. I mean, I hear this a lot. I hope I'm trying to provoke you both equally. Um, I hear this a lot, you know, like, you know, everybody was worried about television. Your grandmother was worried about it. Well, I mean, some people would argue that we have like a breakdown in marriage. We have high levels of, of, of out of wedlock births, high levels of divorce, abortion, contraception, the sexual revolution, depression, suicide, transgender uh, problems, grooming, sexual trafficking of women and the daughter deficit. I mean, it seems like things are bad. Maybe Elvis was a problem. You know, if, but once again, I'm not here to defend Elvis. I'm just here to make clear, uh, Elvis did go fight in Vietnam. Um, <laughs> and my father does love his music. But uh, the thing is, the, the problems that we've all identified kind of circle back to my opening point. We have societal problems, and now we're trying to ignore what can we do to actually solve the fundamental societal problems and instead say, it's that person, it's that okay. thing that's so, the root so, cause. So, but it seems like, and I mean, I went through all those things, now maybe everybody doesn't agree those are problems, but I think those are problems. I think like the daughter deficit's a real problem. You have like, you know, you, when, you, when you're encouraged to have small families, you choose boys. And so you have a daughter deficit and then girls become commodities. We have all these social problems, breakdown of the family, et cetera. And you seem, Josh, to be saying, yeah, part of that's because big tech's part of this problem. So it, it is a part of it. I, I don't want to oversell my case here. I mean, I will, I will definitely grant Carl the premise that it is not like, it, it, is, it is not the end all be all of all of, our, of all of our problems. Ultimately, we're suffering from kind of a spiritual crisis and a crisis of declining church attendance and, 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 a, and a crisis of existential meaning. Um, that really is kind of like the, the ultimate source of everything that you kind of mentioned, I think. But um, uh, to answer your question more narrowly, yeah, of course it's a problem, but I'm not, I don't want to pretend like it is like sure. the wellspring of everything. But, but I mean, sorry, yeah, of course, I, and that's fair. I didn't mean to put that up on you, but it seems like Carl says, look, that's not a big deal. But in a sense, you're saying, well, it's part of the problem, and so we have to do something about it now. So in speed, is that right? I mean, what, what do you think we should do about it? I think the problem with big tech, as I've tried to outline it, uh, is that it is exacerbated in a lot of ways, a lot of pre, a lot of pre-existing trends. It has exacerbated kind of um, the atomization of society, the kind of siling of society into kind of separate warring tribes that barely interact with one another, that quite literally see different algorithmic feeds from one another, that are kind of that have feeds manipulated literally quite 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 even worse than seeing different feeds that have feeds that are manipulated that are tailored to you based on your beliefs and who you're friends with to rile you up and make you hate the other side more it is only exacerbating kind of the further breakdowns of society of, of, of family so it is it is exacerbating a lot of the trends here but a lot of it is you know in law we would say um, is like a, it, uh, it's sua sponte it's like it's like they have started like it is of their own volition that they have started and a lot of that is, again, like kind of like, for example, the, the recent Wall Street Journal investigations about Facebook and Instagram in particular, I think are pretty damning, to be honest with you. I mean, this company, again, Facebook, in, in this particular case, seems to have known that Instagram, the way that they were aggressively pushing it, was a real problem, especially for like teenage girls in particular. And yet they, they were going ahead with, obviously, this Instagram for kids platform that looks like it's kind of in limbo right now. And a lot of this is because th that they rightfully, properly, under kind of their interpretation of standard corporate law in America, Milton Friedman, shareholder, profit maximization, all that stuff, they were rightfully doing what was best for their shareholders under existing structures of, cor of corporate law. But the ultimate question for people like me who identify as you know, uh, national conservatives or kind of s s skeptics of, of straight neoliberalism, I guess it, you, you might say, the, the issue is when a company is, to kind of borrow the term from the great English common lawyer, Sir Matthew Hale, so quote, clothed in the public interest, is it actually best for the polity, for what Aristotle would call the polis, for the common good, for the national interest of the whole, to just simply say, go John Stuart Mill, go live and let live, just go maximize your profits, just do whatever. And I submit that the answer is quite simply no. That there are some companies, be they ostensibly private or not, that are so fundamentally important. And, and these, in the particular context of what we're talking about here, the data privacy, the algorithm manipulation, the 
cigarette addictive status of some of these products, it is wholly just and proper, and I would actually argue profoundly conservative, to try to put up firm guardrails and tailor and try to channel these market forces towards a ultimate endpoint that is more conducive to the common good in a way that is a slightly different than simple, pure, unadulterated shareholder maximization. Okay, so we have just a couple of minutes, we're going to bring up Q&A, so I'm going to ask, I'm going to try to be disciplined, and you guys have to be disciplined and fast answers, but let me ask you this. James Poulos, uh, American Mind, said he's worried we're going to go, from, I don't want to misquote him, but we're going to go from Facebook to Fedbook, right? So now whatever James means by that, here's my question for you. <laughs> okay, if you get the government to control these like to regulate these institutes. What's going to stop regulatory capture? What's going to stop like Facebook with all its lobbyists to basically take over the administrative date, which is already kind of leans left anyway, and to actually make the situation worse than it already is because now the government and Facebook are in collusion? That's a hard question, short answer. Well, James is a friend. Uh, in fact, on my flight back to Miami tomorrow, I'm going to read an excerpt from his forthcoming book and then got to write a, write a response to it. So it's funny that you asked about him tonight. Yeah. Um, I have his book, yeah. Um, uh, look, so I don't, I, I don't want to quote unquote nationalize Facebook. That is not my stance. Um, uh, I, I support good old antitrust regulation for a company like Amazon, for a company like Facebook, where, the, where, where there are pronounced network effects, we would say in kind of you Chicago law and economics jargon. I actually support common carrier regulation, which is quite distinct, I think, from full scale nationalization. Okay, and so in, in short, common carrier means? Common carrier regulation effectively means, it, it, it's an adoption going back to like 1500, 1600 at common law. At common law, excuse me, there are some companies that are so cloth in the public interest that you basically provide certain carrots and sticks in a correlative reciprocal fashion. So in this case, for a company like Facebook, the carrot has actually already, already been provided. The carrot was a section 230 extra legal immunity from 1996, but there hasn't been a stick here. So because they have this extra legal immunity, the stick would be effectively kind of an anti-discrimination principle where you can't keep someone from being on your platform. Obviously, there will always be some exceptions, some dispensations to that, but that's, that's the basic rule. You, get, you have this extra legal immunity. In exchange for that, you have an anti-discrimination principle. Okay. You have a different take on that, right? You, you're, you would be worried that if you, if you get the state regulating Facebook, it's going to actually create serious problems. I, and look, I was born in D.C. My dad moved there from South Bend, Indiana. I was actually born in D.C. I grew up in D.C. And I'm a lobbyist, and I see how D.C. works. The opportunity for abuse is so high. The opportunity for, to your point, regulatory capture is very high. Uh, if the concern is that we are going to, quote unquote, lock in the incumbents, there's an old saying, regulation is corporate welfare for incumbents. Why? The more tough it is to comply with a law, the easier it is for the people who are already complying with it, the people who have armies of lawyers. There's a reason why Facebook is out there saying, we can get rid of Section 230, or we can amend Section 230 when no one else is. You know who's supporting Section 230? MeWe, the founder of MeWe, a very conservative small startup, says we need to expand Section 230 so we can compete with Facebook. Who also supports Section 230? The CEO of Parler, a conservative group. Why? Because they don't have the armies of attorneys. So what we're trying to do is say, well, we need to create competition, and then we need to impede competition. Those two concepts can't live simultaneously. And with respect to the, the, the Facebook stuff, and the comparison to tobacco is a false analogy. It, it, it's a very sexy analogy. It'd be like, oh, everybody hates cigarettes. Let's compare it to that. But Representative Waxman, who is the guy who led the, the tobacco investigation, said, no, they're completely different. Cigarettes basically have no demonstrable good. The study that came out that was bombshell that was released from Facebook found that one out of five teenage girls feel worse about themselves after using Instagram, which is horrible. That's 20 percent. But let's flip it on its head. 80 percent of teenage girls either feel nothing, no, no change in emotion, or feel better about themselves. So we're talking about 20%. So that means there's a potential good. So the analogy to tobacco doesn't make sense. It's a great use of statistics to prove what you want. And you know, there's an old saying, there's lies, damn lies, and then there's statistics. Okay, so 
You had to close here and then we're gonna go Q&A. What do you think needs to happen right now? Leave it alone, change anything. What's your take on, you're a conservative, you're concerned about certain things. What's your approach to big tech in under a minute? I would much rather empower consumers to vote with their feet. If you, I, I would suspect a lot of the younger people in this room barely ever use Facebook. I barely ever use Facebook. We vote with our feet. Uh, I had a conversation with a student this uh, earlier today. You know what the number one app they use? Snapchat. I never use Snapchat. People will vote with their feet. The difference between Facebook and the federal government is it's a heck of a lot harder for me to vote with my feet to move to Canada or Mexico than it is for me to leave Facebook or YouTube and go use a competing service. And so I could support more transparency. We could all have more information and make better informed decisions. But at the end of the day, it's up to the individual. We can vote with our feet. If I don't ever want to use Facebook again, I don't ever have to use Facebook again. Josh? Sure. Um, so look, I, we heard kind of for years and years as kind of this kind of anti-big tech momentum started to build. There was kind of the James Damore uh, quasi-scandal, you might say at Google back in 2017. He was, a, he was the conservative programmer, if you, if you recall. Then um, you know, Alex Jones won the first who was deplatformed from Twitter, right? I'm not an Alex Jones fan, just to be clear here, but I, I do remember when he was deplatformed. Um, when, when this started to happen, a lot of the rhetoric that we started to hear from both liberals and libertarians was basically just like, you know, build your own Google, like whatever, you got a, you got a problem, just build your own Google. It kind of became like a, a hashtag, a talking point in its own right. Like learn to code. Like learn to code, exactly. Um, I think the build your own Google talking point died the day that Apple, Amazon, and Google nakedly colluded to nuke Parler out of existence after what happened on January 6th. Um, they showed that by, again, what from my perspective was pure collusion. I can't prove they were talking over emails, but like there's a, there's a, there's a doctrine antitrust called parallel conduct that I, I, and I'm kind of waiting for this antitrust case to be brought myself. I have some lawyers I've kind of been talking to a little bit about it. We'll see if that happens. Anyway, um, when Amazon Web Services, kind of Apple, which controls obviously the App Store, and Google, which controls the Google Play Store for Android, nuked Parler, the build your own Google thing died. I mean, Amazon is, we haven't, we've barely touched on Amazon. Amazon is obviously a behemoth in its own way. Amazon Web Services um, is by far the biggest market share uh, as, far, as far as cloud hosting here. So I don't think build your own Google at this point is viable. And what I have called for is, is a kind of an all of the above way to kind of rein in, rein in these companies. The, the specific remedy will depend on the specific nature of the company. For some companies like, like Amazon and Google, I would, I would support truly just old school bust them up antitrust. For a company like Facebook, I would support common carrier regulation along the lines of what I just described here. And Section 230, which, we've, which we haven't really discussed, maybe it'll come up in Q&A. Um, Section 230 is both incorrect as it's normally interpreted by the courts, as Justice Thomas himself has alluded to in his, and most recently in the case called uh, Knight this past April. And we also should statutorily modify Section 230's so-called Good Samaritan provision, but perhaps we'll, we'll get to that in Q&A. Okay, thank you both. That was great. We have a little time for Q&A. Um, I have more questions, so if you don't have cues, I have lots of them. Anyone have a question for Josh, uh, Carl, or, or both of them? Thank you. So you mentioned 230 real quick. So as an amendment, well, I guess personally, the way I read 230, if 230 didn't exist in its current form at least, I don't believe that any platform could exist because they would just be sued into non-existence. There are some people uh, who are suggesting an amendment to 230 where you would take away those protections for algorithmically um, you know, upvoted content. You know, so the content that mm -hmm. Facebook is using its algorithm to promote, that doesn't count towards 230, but things that aren't algorithmically promoted um, would still have those provisions. What are your guys' thoughts on that? So with respect to, to 230, uh, the easiest way to describe Section 230 is um, if you do no content moderation, the, the old law was if you exist, if you engage in no content moderation whatsoever, you let everything go, pornography, hate speech, bullying, blah, 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 you assume zero liability. You assume zero liability. If you instead attempt to kind of clean up your, your site or service, you try to remove some pornography, you try to stop bullying, 
you are not going to assume liability for everything. So that's, that's the paradigm that Section 230 put into place. With respect to your question is, once you begin using algorithms to adjust the outcomes, what happens? So Section 230 is, is I describe as the most misunderstood law of the internet. The New York, to New York Times has twice blamed it as being responsible for hate speech and content moderation and twice issued corrections the next day that it turns out it's the First Amendment that allows both those actions. Section 230 essentially gets you to the legal conclusion faster. It makes it less expensive on courts. It makes it less expensive on defendants. So in your example, uh, let's presume my content is removed today and, and I sue you, let's say your Twitter, and I say you, you remove my content. You Twitter would say Section 230 allows me to remove content that I subjectively find objectionable. Case dismissed, Twitter pays about $50,000 in legal fees. Without Section 230, we, move, we go beyond that. And eventually we would go to a pleadings, we would go to discovery, we would go to a motion for summary judgment. Uh, and at the, we reach the conclusion and Twitter will say, you breached your contract. When you signed up for this service, you agreed to abide by our community standards. We agreed to create the service, pay for the infrastructure, pay for the internet, pay for the engineers, advertise the service. You agree to abide by our community standards. You breached your contract, therefore it is Breach of contract, case dismissed. The only difference there really, same outcome, plaintiff, I would lose. The only difference is instead of Twitter spending $50,000, they spend about two or $3 million. Twitter can afford that-ish. They're, they're not, to, to Josh's point, they're not as big as we think they are. Uh, MeWe certainly can't. Uh, new competitors, Donald Trump just announced his new system. He will be sued into oblivion without that quick dismissal. To your question about algorithms, the, the adjustment to algorithms gets us into the same financial problem. Because let's go through the same fact pattern. This is my law professor hat coming on, so sorry about this. I sue you for removing my content. You say Section 230. I say, but aha, it was because of your algorithm that it happened. You say, nah, uh how do we solve that? Well, we have to go to discovery. And then you have to turn over all your code and we'll pour, pour over your code and decide and come to some maximized conclusion. Uh, let's presume that it turns out it was algorithmic bias and 230 is no barrier. Well, then what do we do? We move on to the next stage and we get to breach of contract again. Same outcome, but it is once again will cost millions of dollars in legal fees that the small guys can't sustain. This is why I suspect you've started to see Facebook calling for amendments to Section 230 because it will make it much harder for the next Snapchat, the next TikTok, the next uh, MeWe, the next Rumble, who has over 70 million users, by the way, to, to grow because they will not be able to achieve that size and that scale because they will live under the barrier of legal fees. I will just leave one last point on this. No other nation in the world has Section 230. And, and some say, well, no other nation in the world has Section 230. Why should we have it? Virtually every other nation in the world operates in what's called the English model for law. And the easiest way to think about that is it's called a loser pays system. Same fact pattern. I sue you for taking down my content. No Section 230. We get to a breach of contract decision, I lose. Suit costs him $2 million, him being Twitter. I have to pay him now $2 million to cover all of his legal fees. If we operated like the rest of the world in that type of system, then the frivolous lawsuits wouldn't exist because people wouldn't sue when they know they're gonna lose. They can sue today when they either wanna drive you into the ground in legal fees or they wanna make a quick buck. So in the grand scheme of things, if we were to move over to a loser pays tort system, I think that would be a net win for the US. Uh, and it would render Section 230 much less necessary than it is today. So I guess I'll make three points. One is, I was thinking about this earlier, actually. We had a discussion at lunch, and we were talking about 
um, shadow banning and banned and how it's mostly just anecdotes. And I was going back and I was looking at this this afternoon and rereading some Senate testimony from the past couple of years here. And I remember the reason that I couldn't recall off the top of my head any kind of like concrete data pertaining to how many like conservatives have been banned vis-a-vis -vis liberals, whatever. And the short answer is we don't have any because despite repeated calls for these companies to be transparent about their algorithms and their terms of service and how they're making kind of um, a basic platform access decisions, they have refused to do so here. In fact, there's been some pieces of legislation that have been introduced on the Hill. I can't remember off the top of my head exactly who has introduced them. It's probably like Josh Hawley or Ken Buck or something like that, that have effectively tried to kind of mandate that these um, algorithms and, 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 and how they're making banning and platform access decisions be made public. I, I, I wholly support that there. In fact, it would really kind of diffuse the debate a lot. People on my side of this debate would really kind of be mollified substantially if we could actually see evidence that they were not trying to manipulate us, holding, holding even aside kind of the tailored algorithms, the actual feed, as far as basic just banning and shadow banning and, and all that stuff. Um, so it, it kind of raises the obvious question as to what these companies are, are, are hiding, honestly, from my perspective. On the algorithm point, there have also been a piece of legislation introduced that I've, that, that I've supported, which basically kind of would modify Section 230 and basically say that you might lose your, um, you know, your extra legal immunity under the statute if you manipulate your algorithm to do X, Y, Z things. Obviously, the specific language in any proposal is the devil's always in the details, so it's going to depend here. But I definitely do support some sort of government role as far as um, dictating what is and is not worthy of the 230 extra legal immunity here. Just so everyone is, 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 is aware, though, as to what exactly Section 230 has done, because I think this is, a, this is like a higher level point that oftentimes gets kind of lost in the weeds here. Section 230 fundamentally treats the companies as platforms and not as publishers, right? That is kind of the fundamental distinction, because publishers still uh, are, I, I, work, I work in Newsweek, I know this extremely well. I'm both a lawyer and the opinion editor of Newsweek. Publishers are still technically subject to the common law of defamation. Now, the common law of defamation, as I was getting at earlier, has been substantially watered down since uh, an incorrectly decided 1964 Supreme Court case called New York Times v. Sullivan. But the common law of defamation does still exist. And according to Section 230, how they define the term interactive computer service, ICS, throughout the statute, the platforms are not are not publishers, they're not treated as publishers. So, so, they, so they actually have extra legal immunity above and beyond what the common law normally provide here. My argument on 230 is fundamentally that the platforms are no longer acting as just neutral platforms. We see this over and over and over again. The example that I brought up in our lunch conversation, which I think is the most preeminent example, there's the single best that I can think of, there's a million examples, this is the best one that I can think of though, is October 2020, one year ago, during this exact time, like one year ago to the day, at this time, the New York Post was locked out of its own Twitter account. It was locked out of its own Twitter account because it reported on what we all know to be the Hunter Biden laptop report that no one wanted us to know on the eve of a monumental election. The New York Post, the nation's fourth largest newspaper by circulation, where I have written dozens and dozens of op-eds. I love that newspaper. I grew up in the New York area. I grew up reading that newspaper all the time was locked out of its own Twitter account. And the link to the article, you, we were banned from sending it over DM. And if I remember correctly, you couldn't even find it on Facebook either. Facebook did much the same thing. You know, talk about kind of the parallel conduct again, like I mentioned earlier. How in the world is that a neutral platform that is deserving of extra legal immunity in derogation of traditional common law rights and duty? It makes no sense whatsoever. They are transparently operating as publishers here. So, um, at this point, I'm a little, i probably a little far from what your question was, which I can kind of barely remember, so I'm going to cut myself off there. Um, but hopefully, I kind of answered it. Good. Yeah, that's it. So I think one thing on 230, and I'm not a lawyer, so which means I will be the clearest person in the room <laughs> describing the law, um, is that in, two, in Section 230, it's you, a company has, or say a platform, it started, I think, with CompuServe versus Prodigy, and, and Carl kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, somebody was letting everything go, and then Prodigy decided they were gonna make it a little bit family friendly, and then they got sued for libel. So they created this space where you can do some moderation and control. So like, I work with Dan at the Acton Institute, and if you come into our comments pages and say all this terrible stuff, we can just moderate it, 
we're, we're not, you know, but if, but if somebody says something that we don't moderate, we're not liable for that. Same with the Hallenstein Center, et cetera. Um, the question I think you bring up, especially with the, the Hunter Biden laptop and some other things is when you, when you act in a way, and like Glenn Greenwald, you know, who's not a conservative, mm -hmm. was very critical of this, basically arguing that Facebook and Twitter and others made a decision that they thought a piece of reporting that they didn't think was verified, they decided they were gonna block out the New York Post for this thing. And as you mentioned at lunch, it turned out that it was true and verified, right? Mm -hmm. And so you had this, this company that has the benefit of 230 as a moderator, in a sense, over moderating and thereby violating the, the, the carrot stick point, right? That's, that's your big, am I getting your concern right? That like, okay, if you're over moderating, like getting, getting the Nazis off and watching out for pornography, and do, okay, that's part of the 230. When you ban a reputable newspaper from telling a story for three weeks or two weeks, then you're, now you're involving yourself in a way that takes the benefit of 230 and not the responsibility. When you bet a sitting president of the United States, you are a publisher, not a platform, period. Done, like end of story right there. Well, you are not gonna like So that. yeah, I, I thought the New, York, the New York Post story was an interesting one. Who here heard about the Hunter Biden laptop? Probably everyone in there, okay. Uh, you were able to access the article, correct? Yes. In fact, there is a theory that because these platforms made such a big deal about it, it's called the Streisand effect, that People, it actually got a much more popular response. But the point that I'm making is these are not the only means of access. The New York Times' inability to post on its Twitter account because it breached its terms of service, because it broke its contract, because it broke its promise with Twitter, wasn't able to and wasn't precluded from getting that story out. In fact, it was quite the story. In fact, everyone heard about it. So the idea that, oh, I can't speak on Twitter. Nobody can hear me speak. For the New York Post, they're one of the largest news publishers in the world. Donald Trump getting kicked off Twitter. Donald Trump today could go into his backyard at Mar-a-Lago and hold a press conference, and I could guarantee you CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News would all be there in a heartbeat. I don't think the former president of the US has ever had a problem getting a microphone in front of him. And the fact that he can't get on Twitter, big deal. Uh, some, some conservatives think had he not been on Twitter, he might have actually won this election. Now you asked for some statistics. Let me give you some statistics because I was able to pull them after lunch. Okay, so in YouTube, there's something called restricted mode. Restricted mode is for content. Uh, it's kind of like safe search. We don't necessarily want it fully accessible to everyone on the initial search. And this is one of the big complaints from PragerU. PragerU is a conservative group. They've had over a billion views on YouTube, by the way. They haven't paid a cent for it, right? They haven't paid a single dollar to YouTube. They've had a billion views, a lot of popularity out of it. Okay, so uh, shows that, so PragerU's videos, 12% were put in restricted mode. 12%, still accessible, you can access them, you can go to YouTube, YouTube posts the content, pays for, pays for the service, all, everything. 12% of their videos are in restricted mode because it's controversial content. Okay, that's, that's a lot, 12%. Okay, uh, Young Turks, Young Turks is a far left group, kind of the, the mirror image of PragerU. 71% of their videos are in restricted mode. 71%. Okay, what about The Daily Show? Daily Show is 56, per, sorry, 54% restricted. The Daily Show. Democracy Now, also far left, 46% restricted. So four times as many restricted videos from Democracy Now as PragerU. And The History Channel, 24% of their videos are in restricted mode because it would be something like the Holocaust, which I want to have conversations with my children about. I don't want them stumbling across. So, the, there's this argument of, oh, they're trying to suppress us. And I can show you the reams of data that the most popular Facebook feeds are conservative or the most popular Twitter feeds are conservative. But that doesn't mollify anyone because it's a feeling at the end of the day. And my wife's a child therapist and she's trying to explain to me when we're talking to our children, you can't use facts and data to disprove a feeling. And conservatives feel like they're being censored. I can prove you all the data. Um, I can show you everything. The Clarence Thomas video coming down on Amazon video was one of 
thousands of videos that all came down simultaneously because it was part of a short form video category, category that got eradicated, but conservatives said, oh, it's only about conservatives. And that's the problem. To the extent that we're interested in facts that prove that our feelings are wrong, it seems not a lot of people are interested in that. And if I were to prove you, show you the facts that it's 51% Republican, 49% Democrat, then the Democrats would be yelling. So it's a lose-lose scenario. It's a Kobayashi, Kobayashi Maru created by uh, some people who just want to be angry at tech. And at the end of the day, what are they trying to do? They're trying to work the refs. They're like two parents trying to tell their kids to pick which, which one that they're going to go with. Are you going to go with the Democrats and uh, take, uh, take down all the content? Are you going to go with the Republicans and leave it all up? And what they're trying to do is just yell and scream like a parent at a soccer game so that the referees, the people stuck in the middle, start calling it their way. Look. Uh, sure, sure. All right. I, I, I will keep this extremely short. Um, a psychologist by the name of Robert Epstein, I, I almost said Jeffrey Epstein, that would have been a Freudian stuff. <laughs> A psychologist by the name of Robert Epstein, who, if I recall correctly, was a partisan Democrat, a Hillary Clinton voting choice team, who has closely studied this, testified, I can't remember the, the exact committee, probably like Commerce Committee, possibly Judiciary Committee, I can't remember the exact committee. And he basically said that, up, that Google specifically probably manipulated upwards of 2.6 million votes in the 2016 presidential election here. Now, that is an astronomical figure. That is an astronomical figure here. And look, I've worked at the Daily Wire. You know, Carl worked, or he mentioned um, Daily, Daily Wire Venture Bureau. It's true, they do really well on Facebook. I, ben, had, ben had Mark Zuckerberg's number basically on speed dial. Um, that's great. I see that in retrospect, and I think that this is probably a really kind of easy, shiny, convenient way for Mark Zuckerberg to tell the world that he's not censoring conservatives, to be honest with you, because the Daily Wire and Ben Shapiro are always to the top 10 pages. I don't have like concrete evidence for that, obviously, because they won't open the books and show us what they're doing, but it, I think that is as plausible a theory as any. But look, when a partisan Democrat psychologist it's testifying that millions of votes are being swayed due to algorithmic, algorithmic manipulation. That's a problem. That is a huge problem. And people who actually care about, quote unquote, our democracy, which what you hear a lot of the protesters, especially on the left, say these days, they ought to recognize that as a fundamental problem along the same lines of what I was saying earlier about how we are outsourcing our own sovereignty, ultimately outsourcing large swaths of our own kind of collective national destiny to these unaccountable private actors in Silicon Valley. It's interesting because a lot of this actually comes back to free services. Right? Once you use a free service, you're in a relationship where data is collected and, and control and all these things come back. So it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting question. Do we have one more question from the Mr. Churchwell? This uh, question is initially directed towards Carl. Um, it's more of a philosophical than a procedural question. Okay. But um, in the 60s and 70s, you have Marshall McLuhan, you have Neil Postman, uh, Jacques Ellul, Yvonne Illich, just a, a different group of cr uh, people critiquing technology. Seems and nice. the argument is essentially that, eco um, that technology, the changes are ecological. In other words, when you had the printing press in 1450, by 1500 or 1520, you didn't have a Europe plus the printing press. You had a brand new Europe. It, it, it fundamentally, ecologically changed the, the, the area. And so a lot of people are making that same argument from the 60s on the, t uh, the internet age that now we're coming in. Uh, the Carl Benedict Frey in his great book, The Technology Trap, so, you know, two to three generations, you have these major revolutions with technology. Um, and so at lunch, I heard you say you thought technology was neutral. And then I heard you allude to it a little bit tonight in, in, in some of your examples. Do you sincerely believe that technology itself is, is neutral, therefore not ecological? So, and this came up during lunch, I used the example of a tool. So technology, like my smartphone, where is it? It's, it's in my pocket. That's a tool, right? There you go, there's an example. It's a tool, it can be used for good or bad, uh, the example we were talking about at lunch, I think, was a knife, because we were, we were eating lunch. A knife is a tool, right? A knife can be used to cut my chicken, 
a knife can be used to harm somebody. And as a society, did we outlaw knives? No, of course, that's crazy. But what did we do? We outlawed battery. We outlawed murder. We identified a specific harm and made that the criminal act. I could use this book to bludgeon somebody to death. We can't outlaw books. So what we're trying to do here is recognize that it is a tool. That phone can be used for incredible good. If somebody gets drops down right now, we can find the nearest hospital, we can dial 911, we can have emergency services. The Apple Watch can uh, help my, my mother when she collapses get emergency help immediately. Incredible good. But it can be used for incredible bad as well. There's a lot of horrible things on the internet that are, you know, have existed for, for hundreds of years but are also on the internet that we can get rid of. So it's a tool. So what do we want to do as a society? Do we want to outlaw certain practices or do we want to outlaw the bad effects? And I've always been an effects-based individual. That's why I wanted to start a conversation with definitions. What is the objective we are trying to achieve? And then we work backwards to stop it, not stop, the, stop what I see as a bad action now and it may have all these unintended consequences down the road. So that's where I do think that the, this is a new technology, it's a new tool, but it's something that we as a society are getting our hands around. Uh, historically, I remember there was a panic about, uh, a great example is fo uh, photographs. So the actual origin of the idea of the right to privacy came from a law review article centered around photography, and it was back in the late 1800s, and everyone, uh, the, the judges who wrote that were terrified that the camera would destroy our right to privacy. Well, heck, I've got six cameras on me right now. Our moderator has one on, on the table. You've got one right in front of you. And we adapt, we adjust, we change our perspectives. And that's kind of the thing that we do need to somewhat embrace. We try to take the best from what has come before us, we add on, to it what we have today, and we hope that we leave the world in a better place for our children. And for me as a parent, when I go home, I hope I do the best job I can to teach my children how to use this tool correctly, just like I teach them knife safety before I, teach, before I have them start whittling by themselves. And that's the personal responsibility that you talk about in your book, your 10 steps. We as individuals need to take it upon ourselves to understand the technology before we hand it to children before we hand it to teens. We need to take it upon ourselves to understand the technology before we hand over our data. And we need to take it upon ourselves to do the right thing. And to the extent that there is a potential role for government, which I am really worried about, it could be centered around something like better transparency. So we have more information on what happens so we can make better informed decisions. But I don't want the government telling me what I can and can't do in my own home with my own children, you know, uh, as, as a parent and as a member of my family. All right, thank you both for the healthy debate about whether big tech um, is harmful or not. Um, I appreciate the mention of specific harm. Uh, we have media houses and they're all leaning liberal and conservative. And I don't know that anything has been done about that. Is that harmful? Um, because we're having a healthy debate today about whether big tech is harmful um, if they are leaning conservative or liberal. So we seem to be focusing on organization or a part of society but if what media houses are doing, leaning liberal or conservative, is a specific harm, should something be done about That sounds like root cause to me. Should something be done about that instead of, you know, should I be silenced for whether I'm leaning liberal or conservative? Should my organization or a sector of the economy be regulated? for whether they're being liberal or conservative. So, if, 
sorry. If, if a sector, an entity, an organization is committing some kind of harm to the United States, to people, because they are leaning liberal or conservative, if it's a harm, shouldn't there just be a uniform application, regulation, law, concern, debate about it in general, instead of, let's just go after big tech. So that's kind of what I'm wondering. So I'd like to learn more about that. So this somewhat came up a, a little bit at lunch as well. And um, so we have protected classes for discrimination, uh, race, religion, country of origin. Political class is not a protected class in our nation. And one of the challenges is we often think of it as binary liberal, conservative, Democrat, Republican. Political groups are, you know, there, there are hundreds, there are dozens, hundreds of them. And each one thinks that their political view is a correct one. But those political groups include things like Hamas. Those political groups can continue to be things like Antifa. Political groups can be things like the Nazi party. Now, if I am creating a business and I want to encourage the most people to come to it, allowing or facilitating a robust discussion of Nazism or Hamas or Antifa may be antithetical to what I'm trying to do, which is appeal to the most people. So what we end up seeing from a lot of my members is they are much more concerned with creating a platform that'll everybody wants to be on, so they're gonna kinda of tone down the extremes and let it come a bit more to the middle. So they're not gonna be anti-liberal or anti-conservative because why would you cut off half of society? What they may be is anti the edge, which is why a lot of people may get removed or limited because they're on those edges but not in the middle. And that's who we're trying to appeal to, the, the, the big fat part of the bell curve. But simultaneously, they have to take into account their advertisers. Because one of the things YouTube faced uh, about a year ago was an exodus of advertisers on their sites because of controversial or extremist content. And it was businesses like Coca-Cola stopped advertising because they didn't want their brand seen anywhere near controversial content. So I think when we're talking about party neutrality, it's much more exercise than it actually exists, because what we're doing is chopping off the edges. There can still be robust political debate. But simultaneously, let's presume I wanted to create a platform only for Democrats, or I wanted to create a platform only for Republicans, or I wanted to create a platform for no political content, because Lord knows we could use one of those. Shouldn't we have the right to do that? So what we end up getting to at the end of the road is not deciding which political party is OK or is not OK on a site or service by the government, we should allow the businesses to decide what's best for their users and their customers. And if I, as a conservative, feel I'm not being served by Facebook or Twitter, I'll go to Rumble, which is growing considerably over the many years. Can I ask a question on the other side, and then Josh jump, jump in here to respond to that? Um, it seems like one area that maybe has been left out, and you can, you can, you can answer this. It, it seems one area has been left out is like, there is certain, like, so Alexis de Tocqueville, who's the best, um, said that in democratic societies, there's going to be this narrowing of what's acceptable speech. And so right now, for example, um, there's, like, pr pronouns, right, have to be used in a certain way. If someone determines to use a pronoun, you're almost, in a sense, forced to use that pronoun, right? Um, doesn't that seem to be a limiting of speech? Like, that's somehow you're kind of shamed or even silenced or banned from certain sites for that, you would seem to say, I think, well, those are your terms of service. What would you say? As far as whether you should be banned for quote unquote misgendering? Someone? Because, well, no, I mean, this kind of follows on the, the point, like you're, you're banned from this, this, like there's this conservative liberal, like certain things are acceptable and right. outside that you're kind of banned from this, but it's, yeah, whether it's misgendering or, or anything, you, how do, you, how do we relate to, how do we deal with that? Because I think that's one of the reasons why conservatives feel they're being pressured to accept certain anthropological claims about the person and the family that they don't agree with. And if they don't, they're gonna be kind of pushed off of these social media sites. That I think, seems to be the, 
part of the feeling that you're getting to, even if, and maybe the data is not, not there. So what, what's your response to that? So look, I mean, this, this can take us to the, how you modify, you know, subsection C2 of section 230, which is the so-called Good Samaritan provision. So we, we, we still, we're almost done. We still haven't really gotten into subsection C2 here. So this is, there are numerous parts of section 230 that are extremely relevant. This is the one that is most frequently floated in the public discussion here. And it kind of is, is also an easy way of kind of very viscerally communicating to everyone who reads it that the purpose of this statute ultimately was to try and rid the internet of kind of pornography, child pornography, sex trafficking. That really was what Section 230 and the, commun the Communications Decency Act of which it is a part was really about. And you know, I'm not going to pull my phone and read the verbatim text, but subsection C2 basically says that the, the platform shall be, held, sh shall be held, held immune for all good faith content moderation decision pertaining to lewd, lascivious, sexually explicit, or otherwise objectionable content. And the, the latter most phrase, otherwise objectionable content, is kind of a good Samaritan provision that a lot of courts have construed extremely liberally to basically per permit large swaths of content moderation decision. There is a rich body of evidence, I would say, to suggest that it was definitely not intended, nor does the actual plain statutory construction get you there. It actually had a much more narrow meaning. Let's hold that aside. So w there, there are many proposals to, to how to modify um, this language. And one that I mentioned earlier that Carl pushed back at was this um, proposal from Senator Marco Rubio. There's, there's been so many. There's literally been too many Section 230 reform proposals to even keep track of. But I gravitate back to this one from, from Senator Rubio because it's, it's quite simple. And he basically proposes, among other things, replacing that otherwise objectionable language with some concrete terms like promote terrorism or unlawful. Or like, and, and Carl here is talking about, you know, like ham Hamas, um, like incitement to terrorism, um, child sex trafficking. Well, my response to that is, is very simple. I want that to be banned from social media. The way to do that is to just make it unlawful. And then, and, and then say that the, that the tech companies then have permission to take that down. And that, I think, is the most straightforward way of doing this here. I mean, I, I, a lot of people on my side of this debate kind of go down kind of the morally, morally relativistic rabbit hole of free, of free speech absolutism that, like, you know, we stand for um, Marjorie Taylor Greene, we stand for Alex Jones, whatever. I'm actually not a free speech absolutist at all, actually. Um, I, 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 I actually wholly support kind of t uh, having moral assessments, moral judgments, and, and even, if necessary, moral stigmatization of certain forms of speech and types of speech. But that is a role, I think, for the legislature, because to get back to what I was saying at this point like an hour and a half ago, I am kind of a, like a lowercase r Republican in kind of the Hamiltonian mold. And I believe these debates are best held among kind of politicians and elected officials, that's where we should have these debates about what is and is not unlawful or, or popular speech. And when we are delegating our outsourcing of the speech moderation to these private parties, they should be just simply applying what the legislative body has already done. I think it should basically be that simple. On the gender pronoun thing in particular, look, obviously I think it is egregious, uh, just to put it mildly, um, for people to be banned from social media, shadow banned, censored, blocked, muted, whatever, for using biologically correct pronouns. I mean, look, I, I, I'm the opinion editor of a mainstream media organization. The day that I joined, a lot of colleagues were up in arms that they would deign to hire a conservative for that, for that position. And the one, number one article that my now colleagues started emailing to the whole company to say, like, how could you hire this crazy dude was, this piece that I wrote for National Review back in January 2020 that was praising uh, Judge Kyle Duncan on the US Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, the court that I clerked on, for um, coming out opposed to transgender pronouns and, and saying why he would only use biologically correct pronouns. That, that, to this day, is the piece I wrote that gets me in trouble. I was protested at Northwestern Law School yesterday. I was giving a talk there for this article. <laughs> So um, uh, the, the, the cultural ways on this issue are uh, second to none. It, 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 it is really kind of crazy here. And look, uh, again, Congress could do a lot of things here. Congress can directly legislate if it wanted to. They could directly modify something along the lines, uh, if they wanted to, they could add in language and say, um, you know, uh, you shall lose your Section 230 immunity if you make a content moderation or platform access decision that denies people the ability to speak what they believe to be the truth about 
gender and sexuality or something like that. It, it probably could even, it literally could be that simple. All right. Well, I think we're at the end. So I want to thank uh, Carl and Josh for your time. Uh, thanks for coming to Grand Rapids. Come again in the summer. Don't come in the winter. He's making the mistake of going to Ann Arbor in February. Don't do that. Uh, come in the summer. Uh, thank you to, uh, to Jacob, to the Hallenstein Center, and to my colleague Dan Churchwell uh, for organizing this. And thanks to all of you for coming. And I wish you all a good night. Let's have a round of applause.